Well, good morning, everybody. I'm glad that you're here. Happy second week of Easter. Uh, we, we had an incredible week last week. Tons of awesome things happened. Uh, and today we're going to keep uh, the good times going because how many of you guys know the work of the cross was not just for Easter? Amen? Amen. So if you're taking notes today, I'm going to jump right in. Uh, I've titled this sermon, Between Sundays between Sundays. And I, I challenge our students with this. Uh, these two things all the time, I believe that readers are leaders and note takers are world changers. So uh, I encourage you to take notes and uh, we're going to dive into God's word. We're going to start by getting into the book of Acts chapter 2 verse 1. The book of Acts chapter 2 verse 1. And, and last week, like we mentioned, was, was Easter. The biggest day in the Christian calendar. I would say that obviously you can't have Easter without Christmas, and so there's some argument to be made about which one's most important. But uh, the reason that we get the kind of relationship we have with God is because of what Jesus did on that cross, and that he died and rose again. Amen? And uh, this particular passage takes place right after, 10 days after the ascension of Jesus. So right after he ascended into heaven. So he rose from the grave, he spends time with disciples, he's seen by many, and, uh, and then he ascends to heaven. And this is where we're going to pick, off, uh, pick up. And it starts right here, uh, Acts 2.1. If you have it on your Bibles, great. If not, it'll be up on the Sky Bible, as I like to call it. And it says this, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then, they, then what looked like flames of tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone, everyone say everyone. There you go. Present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. I pray that you would help me to communicate your heart and your truth above anything I've written or intend to speak. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, how many of you in here by show of hands believe that community is important? By show of hands, you believe community is important. Okay, that's pretty much everybody. How many of you also believe that your community has an effect on your actions? Who you're with has an effect on your actions, absolutely, right? And we also have probably heard some form of statement with regards to show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And we tell students this and we tell college age students and high school age students and children this, but it's true of adults. It doesn't just apply to kids. I can tell you it's very easy for me and, and I'm sure others to see like we know the different groups of adults that exist as well. Clicks didn't just happen in high school. They just grow older in adulthood. <laughs> we just, we have different t names for it because we don't sit at school lunch together <laughs> anymore. <laughs> so we just go to lunch and it's different, but it's the, kind of the same, right? We all understand that community plays an impact. So uh, I'll say this, there are communities in my life who I can say help me make some smart decisions. And there are some communities in my life that also encourage me to make not smart decisions. So with that, I'm gonna start the service with a, uh, a vow of honesty, okay? And I need you to be honest back. Has anybody here ever been cow tipping? Show of hands, if you've been cow tipping, one person, two people, that one I expected. That one I did not. <laughs> one of those I saw coming, the other one blindsided me. Uh, kind of like cows, um, just if you're not careful. Uh, so in college, speaking of communities, uh, I had a group of friends and we, we got bored. Uh, we must not have had enough homework. And we decided that we wanted to do something interesting on Halloween interesting on Halloween. And so we were talking and none of us had ever been cow tipping before. And we looked it up. It turns out cows are faster than people by a long shot. By a long shot. They just look like they stand around all day eating food, which is pretty much what we were doing in college, but they were a lot faster than us. At the time I was on the track team and so me and my buddies were like, I'd like to try out and figure out how fast a cow really is because it might help improve my times um, if one's, you know, behind me. And so we, uh, we had a friend of ours on the floor and uh, he had a great uncle who lived in the area and he had a pasture full of cows. So we called him up and we got permission from his great uncle to come out and try to tip cows on Halloween. So just the preface, we had permission, okay, students, if you're listening, we had permission uh, and we had consent and we went out uh, 
to do, with permission and consent, a stupid thing. Um, and our plan was to go out there, and here's the thing, if you ever go cow tipping, you don't want to bring loud guys, but you do want to bring strong guys. Uh, my roommate was one of those things, and it wasn't quiet. Um, and so we decided we had some plans, and the rules of this event were that we were going to make sure everybody had a buddy. Everybody had a buddy. We had to stay together with our buddy at all times so that nobody got lost or trampled. But the other bummer was that in Springfield, Missouri, uh, that October, there was a huge pouring of rain that had happened that day. So the pasture was thick with mud. And I didn't have mud boots. I had tennis shoes and jeans. And we went out there with vans, tennis shoes, and, you know, our jeans and got ready. Uh, and then we, I saw kind of the look of the land and I was like, oh no, I, I'm, I'm changing. So I brought, just in case, I brought my running shorts in case I need to get out of Dodge. And my buddy Brody Nolan and I, he was also on the track team, phenomenal runner, fast dude. He was my buddy. And so we made the rules clear, like everybody has a buddy, stay quiet, stay together, and we can push a cow. We brought enough people that we figured, and we brought strong people, we brought enough people that we figured if we all gave it one good run, we might have a chance. But we got out there and the great uncle looks at us and he says, hey, I want to be clear before you get out there, there's one bull. <laughs> and there's a few calves. And he's not kind. He said, if you find yourself in trouble, make sure you make it to the ditch at the end of the pasture. Goes down like this, there's a canal, hit the canal and you'll be fine. They don't go down there. There's barbed wire fence around the entire perimeter, so be careful. Stick together, stay smart, and you won't die. But this wasn't one of those like, ah, oh, a bunch of stupid teenagers, I'm going to go inside and go to bed. No, he brought out a porch chair and a flashlight. <laughs> I want to be like this guy when I get older. I really do. And so he's just chuckling to himself. He was holding a beer in his hand, and he's like, have fun. I can't wait to see the stupid things you guys do. So we hop the fence, get out in the pasture, and begin our, you know, approach. Like I said, my roommate was strong, but he was not quiet. And uh, we're like, all right, dude, Sterling, this is your chance. Just don't spook the cows. And he's like, what? And I was like, sh sh they're, they're sleeping, hopefully. They weren't sleeping. <laughs> Turns out a bunch of college kids having a chat with grandpa up on the hill didn't exactly mood setting for sleeping. So he approached the cows as quietly as he could and it's dark and we're all creeping and sloshing in the manure and mud and field and uh, we approach and they are creepy at night. Just creepy, creepy at night. And you get nice and close and Sterling's just like, hey, I think that they're close. It's like, I also think they can hear. Shh. We get nice and close, and we got like close, 100 yards out. They heard us, stood up, took off. I'm like, well, this is going to be hard. And so we repositioned, and we tried the pincer technique. Two groups, maybe we could force them into the middle so that they could trample us to death, um, which they can do. Uh, and that didn't work. And then the last time, the third try, we hear a little collar a little cow dog, a little sheep dog, came running over, a white border collie with black spots. And we're like, hey puppy, how's it going? And that dog looked up, saw the cows, barked and took off. And they chased them all away. We're like, well, there goes our hopes and dreams. <sighs> but our hearts were racing because as they took off, it sounded like thunder. It's kind of terrifying. We realized shortly after the dog didn't chase them away. It was herding them towards us. And it turned the cattle and they stampeded directly at us. And we all screamed at the top of our lungs like a bunch of small schoolboys and ran to the ditch. Every person, and I took off the best form I've ever had in my entire life. We were a community of people strong until we were challenged. And we took off. And I remember there was one guy who came on that trip who Everybody told him he couldn't come because we were worried that if he went, he would get trampled because he's never done a sport in his life. We're like, this dude is not athletic. That's just not his gifting. He's brilliant. He was an honor student. He had top marks, everything. He perfect score. Everybody really wanted to go. He wanted to experience it. 
And I remember I passed him real fast, didn't even look back. And we're going to call him Johnny for the sake of this story. So I cruise past Johnny. We all slide into the ditch, and the cows came right up against it. And we took out our iPhone 4. Yes, this is how old I am. And we took, took out an iPhone 4, and we took a picture of it. And we have that picture uh, here today. This is the demon cows. <laughs> Look at them. They wanted our blood. They stood at the precipice waiting. And so down in this ditch, we looked at each other and we're like, is everybody here? Because a community stands together. And we were like, where's Johnny? Did you see Johnny? Oh yeah, I passed him a long time ago. One person after another. Oh, I passed him way back. I passed him a long time ago. Nobody saw Johnny. Then little sheepdog came up. We looked at him, and as a team of, of men, we looked at this poor animal, and we said, you are now named Cow. We pushed the dog over, and we said, if anyone asks, we tipped one cow tonight. <laughs> we then made our plan to return back to great uncle's house, and uh, everyone we took, we split into three groups at this time, three different communities. I took the stealthy group and left my roommate far behind. I don't want to die. And uh, we thought we had made it. I was out in the clear, and uh, everyone was out there. I was the last one to run back. I took in the longest route. And they're like, all I hear is like screaming, like, come on, come on. And then I heard what sounded like thunder behind me. As all the cows in the entire pasture chased me, I ran with everything I had. I leaped over the fence, cut up my entire body. I was bleeding everywhere, but I had so much adrenaline that I couldn't even feel the, pla- the pain. It wasn't until the great uncle laughing looked at me and said, you ruined your pants and your shirt. You're dumb. And he was great. He, I, he was the best. And so we're like, man, does anyone know what happened to Johnny? And Johnny was sitting out there with the great uncle. He says, yeah, I'm fine. And I was like, Johnny, you're alive. And he's just like, yeah. And I'm like, oh, thank God. I was going to have to call your mom and tell him you died. And uh, he's like, yeah, you guys all passed me and I saw them chasing you. So I just took a left. Work smarter, not harder. And I was like, that's why you're a genius. So community is important, right? Whether you're being chased by cows or chased by the devil, we all understand that we are better together. Better together. In fact, we were made for community. In Genesis, we see one of the first statements. In Genesis 2.18, it says that God saw Adam and he said, it is not good for man to be alone. And this isn't just like being married. It's saying that people weren't meant to be alone, right? And then we also see that uh, the Harvard study of adult development, this is one of the longest running studies, um, and the talk, the TED Talk that was given uh, seven years ago when it was first came out, it was the most watched TED Talk of all time. Currently, between YouTube and TEDstalk.com, it has over 66 million views. It is on uh, uh, on how we become happy. And I'm going to summarize it. Essentially, they had uh, 1938, they found, was it 700, 724 boys, and they studied them for their entire life. And as of seven years ago, 60 of them were still alive. And the clearest message, and I'm just summarizing as quickly as I can, from this 75-year study was that good relationships keep us happier and healthier, period. See, we realize that community is important, but community is also hard, right? For some of you, the greatest miracle you read when you read the Bible is that Jesus had 12 healthy friendships with other guys. Some of you are like, I have like two friends, and it's hard to keep those going. Jesus had 12? That's the greatest miracle they never wrote about, right? See, we live in a time where we are more connected than ever, but yet we are extremely lonely. 52% of Americans report feeling lonely. 47% report their relationship with others are not meaningful. 58% of Americans reported that they sometimes or always feel like no one knows them well. 73% of millennials say that they are lonely. This checks out. We listen to emo music quite a bit in my day. 25% of people have no one that they consider a close confidant. One in four One in four. Dr. Vivek Murthy, a former U.S. Surgeon General, said this, that loneliness is as bad for your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. 
People who were lonely lived that much less on average. So God created us to be people who are not loosely connected, but people who live in rich community with one another. Last week, we celebrated Easter. We had 19 people get baptized, I think is what I, what I counted. We had, uh, Pastor Rob shared this beforehand, but on Palm Sunday, we had like 50 people between kids ministry and our main service get saved. Uh, the two last youth group services we had, we had over 18 new people alone. Community is important. If there's one thing we learned from 2020 is that we were made for connection, not isolation. And it can't just be loose connections. It has to be deep-rooted community. But last week is gone. Easter Sunday has come and gone, and historically speaking, this Sunday is one of our lower attended weeks, which is why we wanted to challenge people to bring somebody and call this our Bring One Sunday, right? See, one of the most powerful tools we have in our faith is the gift of community. Community that goes beyond Sunday, community that is not annual or weekly, but daily. Life-giving, life-changing community is not what happens just on Sunday, but what happens between Sundays. So I want to challenge us with this idea of what does a spirit-filled community look like? In Acts 2.1, we see that after Jesus left, between the great resurrection, between the ascension of Jesus and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, community kept taking place. And it was in the space of community that we see the Spirit of God poured out. It's incredible. It doesn't say within the place of perfection. It doesn't say within the place of personal devotion. It says within the place of community. Devotion to God above perfection. Consistency over perfection. Community over loose connection. The believers found in Acts 2 were living in the in-between. See, Easter was not the end of the church. Easter is the beginning of it. And it continued all because of communities that were empowered by the Holy Spirit. This morning, I want us to look at the kind of community that God has called us to, one that is only possible with the Holy Spirit, one that takes the place not only on Sundays, but between Sundays. So if you're here and and you're ready, we're going to get into three uh, quick points this morning. And the first is this, is that healthy community requires unity. Healthy community requires unity. It's in the word, right? Community. (laughs) Can't have one without the other, right? See, before we get to Acts 2-1, we see the disciples just witness Jesus go away. Instead of going their separate ways, they continue to meet, though. We need the Holy Spirit involved in our communities to see the power of unity take place. I can tell you firsthand, even amongst your pastoral staff, sometimes we, all who love God, have a hard time agreeing on a place to go eat even. Okay? Unity is not easy, even amongst people who love God, but it's an empowerment of the Holy Spirit that unity is possible. We know lots of great organizations who have great goals and wonderful outlooks and awesome mission statements, but if unity isn't present, they will not succeed. You've never heard a report after the Super Bowl where a reporter comes up to one of the champions and says, what a great performance, and it's just like, yeah, we all hate each other though. It's crazy that we succeeded. No, they got it. They worked together for a common goal. They were unified in their direction, their mission, their vision, and their purpose, and they did not let quarreling get in the way of their goal. In the same way, as a church, we are called to let the Holy Spirit empower us, but we are to commit to unity. Healthy, lasting community is marked by a strong sense of unity. Uh, Victorious teams are marked by unity, and unity is intentional. We are stronger together. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. My wife and I have this in our, in our bedroom because someone put it in a little stitchy thing uh, from our wedding day, and it says this. You've probably heard it in context of weddings, that two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated 
defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. There are even, three are even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. This statement, uh, the thing that my wife got of it, out of it was when two lie together, they will be warm because she is freezing cold at night. Um, and so my job in our relationship is to be the human heater. Uh, but this is not just about marriage. It's not even tied to marriage. It's just talking about community. It's, it exists within the context of marriage because it fits, but it's not limited to it. You don't have to be married to have community. In fact, when they did this study from Harvard, uh, they realized that it wasn't necessarily, unnecessarily marital relationships. It was people that they had deep, honest, rooted connection with that they could depend on to be there for them. In fact, the question that they asked at 80 years old to those people in the study was, do you have somebody you can depend on you to be there for you? And the people who lived the longest from that study all answered yes. Isn't that interesting? That there's not only joy, but there's health in community. Which is crazy because we look at community like a conflict-ridden space of mess. But in the midst of what humans can make messy, Jesus can bring life. Dave Ramsey uh, gives an example of Belgian workhorses, and I'm not going to pretend that I came up with this information because I know nothing of these creatures, but I thought it was cool. A Belgian workhorse can actually pull 8,000 pounds by themselves. Four tons. That is a strong horse. That's a ton of weight. But if you have two random Belgian workhorses together, they can pull 24,000 pounds. And that's pretty impressive, right? You would expect 16, but 24, that's even, that's like three of them. Two can do the work of three. But here's the thing that you can catch. A matched pair, and this is raised together. These were put together at a young age. They've worked together. They're similar size. Uh, they have trained together. A matched pair of two Belgian workhorses, they can pull 32,000 pounds, doubling what they should be able to do alone. It's the things that have a matched identity. You and I have differences, but the identity we share in Christ is a unity that gives us strength in any circumstance. See, we are united by our relationship with Jesus. Galatians 3.26 says this, For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus, and all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. When the gospel enables, this is from Mark Dever, uh, Dever I, I love this, he's a theologian, he says, When the gospel enables us to live in love, even though we may have nothing else in common save Christ, it is a testimony to its power to transform a group. Everyone say group of sinful, self-centered people into a loving community united by a common relationship with Jesus Christ. See, when Jesus becomes the most important thing, unity becomes more about the redemption in us than the separation between us. I love that. When redemption becomes central, unity becomes about our relationship between us and Jesus, not the separation we can find between us. See, God's call for us is to be an example of his loves to others so that we may first, so in this, we must first love each other, right? When I look at Acts 2, I see, um, I see this play out perfectly. So the church should be marked by its love one to another. John 13, verses 34 through 35 says, so now I'm giving you a new commandment, love each other. It's not an optional thing, it's a commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love is for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Did you know that in the Bible, within the New Testament, we have 59 one another statements? 59. So if you wanted to challenge yourself with how you're to treat people, pick a statement. Just look up 59 one another statements. It'll give you all the references. I thought about putting them on the screen and making you read them all, but we don't have time for that. Um, so just look it up. It's great. There's a lot of things there. But what's interesting is 20 of them are about love. Nearly half. I was talking to my wife. We said it could be actually really fun if we took one of these statements uh, and we did one every week. Um, but several of them also include kissing those you meet. Um, so different cultures uh, understand that was a more common greeting um, back in the day. But 20 of them are about loving one another. See, our relationships, this is from Francis Schaeffer, our relationship with each other is the criterion that the world uses to judge whether our message is truthful. Christian community is the final 
apologetic. If our community is our final apologetic, will others see Jesus in us? And the only way they'll do it is not because of our goodness, but because of God's grace. Second point is this, is community is vulnerable before it's powerful. Community is vulnerable before it's powerful. The only on-ramp to connection is vulnerability. It only way it starts. True deep community is never found on shallow spaces. Brene Brown says this, vulnerability is not winning or losing, it's having the courage to show up and be seen. We have no control of the outcome. Vulnerability is not weakness, it's our greatest measure of courage. I love that. So to love is to be vulnerable and communities that are vulnerable are communities that are powerful. C.S. Lewis says this in The Four Loves, he says, to love all, at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of it keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully, round with obbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. I love that imagery. But in the casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken it will become unbreakable, unpenetrable, irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. There's a statement we say in our youth group. I don't know why I got vulnerable about that. (laughs) Uh, There's a statement I say in our youth group every single Sunday to our students, and it's that you are fully known and you are fully loved. It's an identity I speak over our students every week, and I speak it over you today. But unless we can get to the place where even though we know God knows everything, we're willing to give him everything, we're going to be missing out on a deep and transformational relationship with Jesus. It's not that he doesn't know. It's sometimes that we don't let him in. Fully known and fully loved. See, God already knows everything about us, but until we're willing to be vulnerable, open, honest, and real with God, we will not see real life change. It is from an identity rooted in love that we can live a life rooted in powerful change. Eugene Peterson says this, he says, there can be no maturity in the spiritual life, no obedience in following Jesus, no wholeness in Christian life apart from immersion and embrace of community. I am not myself by myself. Can you say that? Can you say, I am not myself by myself. I love that. Community, not the highly vaunted individualism of our culture, is the setting in which Christ is at play. Man, that's good. But it's hard. So the final point as we get ready to close is that community is missional. Community is missional. When you look at Acts 2, we see the outpouring at the beginning, but look at the end of that chapter. Follow me if you can to Acts 2, starting in verse 42. It says this, all the believers, everyone say all, devoted themselves to, his, to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together in the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Do you know how it's possible? Do you know, do you know how we get to a place where you can measure daily growth? The only way you can measure growth daily is if you are meeting daily. It's impossible to measure it otherwise. It's just assumptions. But it says they met together daily. And I love this. The word devote 
in the original Greek where it says, and, and they were all believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, that, work, uh, that word is, is not a one-time occurrence, but it's a consistent habit. It means to continue steadfastly. In fellowship, where it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, we go to amazing grace fellowship, right? We have a fellowship hall, which um, at any church I've ever grown up in is the place of food, Food and fellowship, and, and, and we laugh, but it says that they broke bread together. That was a part of fellowship. Part of the community was just doing life and eating meals. It's a powerful thing to share food with somebody. And it says that a fellowship, or to, a fellowship in the Greek, it's uh, koinonia. Koinonia. Sorry, I did that. I forgot the end. Koinonia. And it's doing life together. What are we doing in this community? Is this the life we do together, or is there something between Sundays? See, as Christians, we're called to be marked as a community who passionately shares the love of Christ to others. In Matthew 28, verse 18, we see the Great Commission to go into all the nations preaching the gospel. And I want to just close with this. Um, In the last year, um, our youth ministry... Uh, has gone from like 30, 35 kids a year ago to an average of somewhere between 60 and 80 kids a week. And I'm not sharing this braggadociously because you need to hear the, the statement really quick. At summer camp, we have this thing that consistently happens where kids go off and they encounter God and they'll come back. And what's crazy about a coal is if you remove a coal from a fire, it will burn out and die. But if you keep a coal, In the fire, it'll continue to burn bright, providing heat and warmth to everything around it. So each year, our prayer is, God, continue what you did on the mountain here in our church. But a prayer without a community will die. And this year, when we came back, our students, not me, not our leadership team, not anybody else, continued that community. And they didn't just gather together, they grabbed everybody they could. They invited every friend they could. Now, some of it was motivated by smashing a pie in my face, but neither here nor there. And uh, and a few weeks ago, we had a night where we called it our our testimony nights. And I invited a couple student leaders to share, and they, three of them ended up sharing. And afterwards, we had four more come up and say, I got to share what God's done in my life. And the following week, we had three more get to share, but it took so much time that we actually had to ask the others who didn't get to share, both weeks one and now two, are now sharing tonight. Because when our community is built around what God has done in our life, we don't have to be eloquent speakers or beautiful teachers We can just enthusiastically share the love of God in our life because we live in a world that is desperate for something real. It's desperate for something just authentic. And what was crazy is I had one of the students they shared, and they're going through a lot right now. And I was talking to them before the second night, and I told them how proud I was of them for sharing their testimony. And we were talking about how crazy it is that anger and bitterness and depression is contagious. It's infectious. It could ruin an entire community. I said, but you know what's crazy is that hope within the body of Christ is also contagious. Hope even outside the body of Christ is contagious. And so our students keep sharing. I challenged our students at the beginning of this year that I wanted them to see a Bible club in every single local high school we started one in, uh, in Filer. There was one already in Kimberly that I have the opportunity to get to be a part of occasionally. And so we started one in Filer the first day of that club. It's Bible Club. It wasn't named a cool thing. It was just called Bible Club, which is social suicide. <laughs> and we had students lining the halls, inviting everybody as they left class to come to Bible Club. Boldly. We had the, the, the class president encouraging, hey, come on in. Hey, you want some free pizza? We got free pizza. And Jesus, the living water, right? Now, and there were. 
And they didn't care what other people thought of them. And then just a little bit ago, uh, this is like two weeks ago, TJ comes up to me and he's like, we want to do it at Twin. And I was like, great, go for it. And Twin Falls starts its first Bible club in a while this coming Friday. And Canyon Ridge is going to start its shortly after that. And God's going to continue to multiply the kingdom of God through communities that take place between Sundays. Church, we don't grow in isolation. We grow in community, and community is missional. Don't leave what God did in you in here. Take it with you out there, because unless you do, it dies here. And the seed that God planted in your heart wasn't meant to die in a pew, but it was meant to live in the world. The great commission is to go into all the nations. The least we can do is take it to our workplace. The least we can do is take it to our schools. The least we can do is share it with our friends. This is what I'll close in. 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has begun, become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God who has given us this task of reconciling people to him what task? Reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. Catch that, because if your reconciliation is built on condemnation, you will not grow anything. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God, for God made Christ, who never sinned, to be our offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. So if you're here today, um, I want to share the, the love of Jesus, the hope we have in Christ is, is for you. We don't just celebrate a God who did something on Easter because the peace we feel or the, the joy of it, it only happens on Easter. Every Sunday is a mini Easter as we celebrate the work of Christ. So as the worship team comes up and gets ready to play, I just want to challenge you and encourage you today. If you're here today and you may have never made a decision to follow Jesus, if you've never made a decision to become a Christian, I want to challenge you and offer you the opportunity. One, I want to remind you and make clear to you God's love for you. I said earlier that you are fully known and fully loved. That's not just a statement for teenagers. That's a statement for you. God loves you wholly and completely, knowing everything there is or could ever be to know about you. And last week, we celebrated the greatest missional work ever. Love manifest in action on the cross, but not limited to the cross because of his resurrection. So if you're here today, would you mind just everyone, would you mind closing your eyes and bowing your heads just out of reverence and honor of those around you just to, to give some space and privacy but if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior or if you're here today and maybe it's, it's time to get things right man we say that community requires unity but you've been holding on to bitterness Community requires unity, but you've been holding on to unforgiveness. And in this church, I'm gonna challenge you, the one thing that God's work is in community is to love people. Love people. And so if you're here today and you say, you know what, I need to get my life right with God. I've been running the other direction. I've been, I've been going a way that's beyond him. If either of those two things are you, either you need to make a decision for Jesus for the first time, you wanna receive that forgiveness, that love, or you wanna reconcile your life, you wanna rededicate your life to him. If either of those are you today, would you mind, just in the space you're at, would you mind just raising your hand and say, hey, that's me. Can you pray for me today? Anybody today? Awesome, awesome. That's wonderful. I see some hands. Anybody else this morning before we go on? Wonderful. Hey, that's amazing. Hey, would you stand with me this morning? Everybody in the whole place, nobody stands alone. We just want to pray together as a community that we would be bonded by our mission and we would be seen in our love. Let's, let's pray together. Say, dear Jesus, thank you that you love me. Thank you that you died on the cross for my sins. Today, God, I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe that you died and rose again. 
and I confess you as my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if that if that's you today and you made that prayer for the first time or rededicated your life, we want to pray with you. Uh, we want to meet with you and encourage you. There's going to be some prayer areas up front uh, that you can come and meet with us after service. We'd love to give you a gift and just uh, just rejoice with you. Uh, but I'm, we're going to get ready to, to take up communion, and I'm going to pass it off to Pastor Robbie.